right. Uh, hello. My name is Cesar Quintero. I am a mentor here living in South Florida in Miami, and I'm here to answer some questions. So let's, uh, let's get to it. Um, my first question is from Christine Ants, uh, and her question is, how do I go about rebranding process? Uh, she's a res real residential realtor with Keller Williams. She has her own brand within Keller and needs help knowing how to best brand it and market it. I have a team logo, the shortened branding initial, and a team logo with brokerage. I have two nice signs that don't have the branding and nothing really flows right now. What would you suggest in making sure my brand is on point? I am confused. All right, Christine, so it depends. If, if you want to be part of the Keller Williams brand as a whole, you would just follow their their guidelines. Um, I'm one of those that likes to go with personal brand a little bit. So if really thinking about what sets you aside from all the other Keller Williams um, um, agents and what what does that, I always go towards purpose values. Um, I, I like, and usually when I go to a branding agency, they always ask me about um, kind of like who, what I stand for, who I am, how I do things. And that gives me a certain personality. So in my case, like orange and black and blue are usually my colors based on my energy and the things I say. Um, my purpose, my my uh, my my purpose is to empower leaders so that they can uh, live the life they want to live. The how I do it is I share vulnerably, I spark action, I leverage strengths, and I share, I spread passion. So. That's how I usually tend to have all my branding and all my, and I have three different companies and my branding is my own within those three companies. Um, so it depends, you, like, you can have an umbrella brand that you can use as your own name, Christine Ants, this is what you stand for. And one of the things you happen to do as a Keller Williams agent and you do different things or, you know, it, it depends on how you want to umbrella the brand. If you're branding yourself first, which is usually how I'd recommend, because I can brand myself and it doesn't matter if I'm here or there or another place, I am the brand. And then I have those seals of approval or associations as part of my brand. So I personally prefer being the umbrella brand individually. That's usually what the personal brand people will tell you. And then everything you do is part of your brand is just part of what you do and who you are. Um, I know that wasn't very clear and direct, but it all depends on the direction you want to go. So if you want to be under the Keller Williams umbrella, then adapt to their branding. If you want Keller, Brinder, uh, Keller, um, Keller Williams to be part of your offerings, but you're the brand, that's the way I would, I would show it. All right, let's go with Lissandra Wilson. Question is, what are strategies for combating budget objections from clients and better conveying the value of my product? So uh, business description is, I have a baking business and specialize in custom cakes and desserts tables. When customers inquire about cakes, I give them the price codes and design options, the so good, better, and best. Even with that, they often feel the cakes are too expensive or didn't know the cake design they originally inquired. So the first thing I would ask you here on cost objection and budget objection is, do you know who your core client is? Um, if you know who your core client and who your persona is, and then you target those people, um, you should be getting less and less objections because the reality is this, a person who's willing to buy a $20 cake is very different than a person who's willing to buy a $150 cake or a $1,000 cake. So if you're targeting the right people with the right message and the right branding, um, it should be coming from a place where you're not having to objectify and, and, and kind of go through every cost objection, right? So um, the way I've done that in most of my businesses is I really understand who my client is, where they are, what they're looking for, what their pain is, and my communications are around the benefit that they get from doing business with me, right? So are you able to differentiate yourself well enough in the messaging so that, because usually cost is either they should already know what they're going towards and not be surprised by the cost of your products if you're targeting them correctly. So if you're asking, if you're talking to the right people and they already know and perceive you as a more expensive brand, like you wouldn't, 
You wouldn't walk into a Louis Vuitton and be shocked with a with a sticker value for their their purses. Or if you go to Coach or you go to different places, different tiers have different expectations. So are you getting the right people to go and quote, get quotes from you? Are you shopping in the right places? Are you messaging the right people? And are you giving and communicating the right brand? Because you can set yourself up as a differentiator in price, but you need to be able to communicate that and show it. So who's your core customer? Are you talking to them the right way? Are you telling them what your benefit is? And that way you pre-qualify them before them even coming to you. Now, if they come to you and they already know that you're a high, high level, all these things, and they get surprised by it, then I love your parentheses you say here, good, better, and best, is what do you position yourself as, right? And always a financial objective is a different type of objective. Like if you wanna go find a cheaper cake, there's other places you can go buy, find cheaper cake. But if you want it from me, you get this, 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 and this, and that's what makes me unique. Now you either take it or you leave it. But that's the value you're willing to be a part of if you're positioning that way. So in my case, I tell people when they come at me and I tell them what my pricing is, I tell them, this is who I am, the ball's in your court. If you wanna do business with me, that's the only way I do business, and that's it. Now, it depends on where you wanna position yourself. In my case, I'm not looking for a new business. So I'm, I'm just telling them, this is the way I need to make it, and that's it. For my other business, it's an online business. Um, I'm usually targeting people that when they come to me, they see the value is so great that when they see the price, they go like, yeah, I, I expected much more. I'm good to go, even though it's an expensive price, right? So it all depends on your positioning and your branding and where you're looking for these people. I hope that helped, Sandra. All right, Billy Rosales, when do you know you are ready to hire others? Good question. All right, business description. Construction company sometimes slow during the winter. Uh, but picks up for a good seven months overall. Hmm. I'm thinking from the background question, the question might be different. So if I were to answer just the question, when do you know you are ready to hire others is when you feel you're doing so many things, you can't concentrate on your superpowers as a business owner. So I think that when I realized that I was doing tasks that I could hire somebody for $20 an hour, $10 an hour to do, and I was not focusing on my superpowers, that's where I start hiring other people. Um, but in your case, I think it's something around seasonality because you're saying it's slow during winter, but then it picks up other overall. So in your case, understanding seasonality, uh, like retail shops in December, they know they need more people during those times because they get an influx of people. So they have temp hires, they have um, ways that they can get people who are looking for a more flexible way of doing of, of being employed and then you just do an upswing uh, during the months that you have high seasonality. For my case, um, I had a food delivery company that was healthy at one point um, that I sold uh, four years ago. And at that point, that company would be really slow between Thanksgiving and uh, Christmas because nobody wants to eat healthy during that time. But then come January, it would jack up and be between January and May, it was really high season. And then summer, it would lull down. So we knew we needed to start hiring two, three months before the high season so that we got enough people trained and, and, and in place, but then we were able to also get that budget in place and make sure that we can project that correctly. So if it's around seasonality, it's make sure you have enough ramp up space to hire and onboard people so that they, when the high season peaks, they're ready to go. And if it's based on just when to hire them is when you're not doing your superpowers the most of the time. I would say 80% of your time you should be doing and dedicating into your superpower time. And then 20% of time should be in tasks and different things. So if you're spending less than 80% on what your superpower is, it's time to find people. All right, oh, sorry, Ricardo Delgado, I got you with, how does a business analyze where they can start improving and scaling? In simpler terms, how does a 100,000 business defer from a million dollar business? They defer in a lot. Uh, your question is what mindset and traits are involved? Okay, got it. So your background, I operate in a barber shop and I am a barber as well. 
How can I start analyzing where to start making more revenue and take action right away? All right, so if you're a barber, you might be stuck in, techni in technician role. So um, there's a book called The E-Myth, The Entrepreneurial Myth, where Michael Gerber talks a little bit about distinguishing a uh, technician from a business owner and from an entrepreneur, right? So um, a technician is somebody who is great at their job and starts a business in order for them to have a job, right? A technician is a barber, I'm a great barber, I can start my own shop and I, I'm, I'm amazing at barber and I'm an artist and I love to do my work, right? The more time you spend in doing that work, the more you started a job for yourself, all right? Which is fine, there's a lot of people, IT, artists, uh, barbers, uh, decorators, cooks, chefs, they like starting things in order for them to have their own lifestyle and have the power to, to have a freedom of their time and do the things that they love to do, right? So if you decide to stay at a lifestyle business, technician work and doing what you love, that's a great place to be. But the difference between a hundred thousand business and a million dollar business is that usually a million dollar business thinks of scale, right? So how do I stop doing what I'm doing in order to scale the company with people. So the more time you spend as a barber, the less time you have spending as a business owner. A business owner is a second space where how do I start thinking about marketing, sales, operations, finances, all these things that strategically will make your company go better. So am I willing to bring in other people to do the work so that I can spend time on the ideas and ideation on how to grow and scale the company more? Right, so if you spend more of your time thinking, you're leading more, that's where it will drive your scale. And then entrepreneur is once you have a business working for you, right? So once you have a business working for you, then you can go in and do another business, another business, because you have enough time to have different businesses. So I went through exactly those three phases. It took me probably around six to seven years to go from technician to to business owner, and it took me around five years to get from business owner to entrepreneur. Now I have three businesses, and my mindset is always about what's next, what's next, what's next, and I have two operating partners that are managing my businesses for me. So um, that's kind of the difference in mindset, right? So one is a technician, the other one's a business owner, which you're still most 80% of your time in the business, and then lastly, you're an entrepreneur when you have multiple businesses working for you. All right, I hope that helped, Ricardo. All right, let's go with Yolindi uh, de Gouveia. Um, question is, what are creative ways on a limited budget to hire and compensate a salesperson, and where would you recommend finding that person? Oof, interesting, okay. I need to employ a salesperson. What is the best way to pay them? Commission only? Yes. Hourly with smaller commission? No. Are simply hourly or no commission if commission based. Then what percentage of the sale is acceptable or standard practice? Okay. We're, we're a pillow manufacturer making decorative pillows and manufacturing pillows. Oh, wow, this, this changes my answer right now. Okay, so, okay, so um, when hiring a salesperson. So what I like to do personally is every time I hiring, doesn't matter what type of position, I always, when I'm talking about compensation, I'm asking the what is what do they need to make and what do they want to make. Those are two different conversations, right? So I distinguish that by saying what you need to make is what you need to make bare minimum to pay your rent, your car, your mobile, your schools, all the things that you need to pay, what's the minimum you can make, like this is what I need, and then I ask, what do you want? What do you want, right? So the need and the want defines two different things, right? The need defines this is the base. This is the minimum that I'm willing to go in and do for. And then the want, I can figure out as a business owner to get that cap and see where I can fit and how how much I can give in bonuses or, or targets so that I can get there. So I apologize. Sorry, this is a long night. All right, so. What I say here is I usually ask them what they need and what they want, and that way I can figure out how to do it. Now, question number one, as the, as the owner of the business, I need to sell the vision. Most people are gonna come to me and lower their salary, lower the things that come and come and work for me, so I need to sell a vision. 
I need to sell the buy-in on why they want to come work for me. That's number one. Number two, I ask him, where do you need to be and where do you want to be? Right? Need, base, want, uh, commission. Now, I learned this from Jack, Sta Jack Daly. Uh, he has a great book called uh, Hyper, -Gro Hyper Growth Sales. And in Hyper Growth Sales, he talks about, um, let me see, can I share a screen here? I don't know if I can share a screen. I don't know if I can share a screen here. Um, all right, so let me let me let me draw you the picture here, so I can do it. So the way the way I like to do this is when I'm when I'm thinking about it, I go and say, okay, what do you what do you need to make? What do you want to make? And that's a gap in between, right? So I always present three options when I'm talking about compensation. So once once I have the interview and I understand what they need and what they want, I go back and I say, okay, what are the scenarios? I can get to that bonus. What are the scenarios I can do that? And thinking about what's your gross profit, how many of how many items does it need to sell in order for them to make a commission? How much is a return on investment? So I come up with three scenarios. Scenario number A, right? Number one is I ask them, okay, you want full base, right? You want to make sixty thousand dollars a year at zero commission. That gives you a sixty thousand dollar total for the year. Option B is you know draw this up it's half of that like let's say forty thousand or thirty five thousand you know base and then i double i put a double commission in there on what they want to make so i make option b what they want to make so let's assume it's thirty thousand and fifty thousand so it's eighty thousand total or last version is i put you zero as a base which is commission only but then i put a uh, hundred thousand or 120,000 as a bonus, and I can figure out how they can get there, right? So what you're looking at is you're looking at $60,000 total, $85,000 total, or $120,000 total, right? Now, depending on where they are, if they choose option A, they're a terrible salesperson. They don't believe in themselves. So I would automatically disqualify them. Now, option B and C, right? A small base and a commission or a pure commission, that all depends on your industry and it also depends on the person that's taking it on. So how long does it take to ramp up in the industry and in the sales or not? So that's where I usually, in your industry specifically, you might have people that are specialized in sales in your industry that don't only represent yourself, but represent other brands in the home and bedding and all this stuff and they can get you into larger places faster. So when you have an industry that has distributors set up I would tap into distributorship more than salespeople directly because distributors will generate much more with much less and they're used to commission only based because they're pushing many products at the same time what I would give them is good incentives so that they can push your product more than other products towards these people there's people that you know plug you into targets and Walmart's and all these things and they're, they're already specialists that help you within certain industries. Now, if you're looking for a salesperson to come and work for you directly, um, usually they would expect a small base and then I would do high, high commission base so that they can get there and they can aspirationally get there. But always know it takes some time to get there. So it's important to ask yourself, you know, what type of salesperson you want. If you want somebody who's more of a distributor or if you want somebody who's more of, um, of a person that comes in, all right, and, and, and does it yourself. Okay, hope that helps. All right, let's go with Cliff Pollard. Uh, when looking to get on social media to start creating content, should my focus be on my personal profile or my company's profile? I'm starting an Instagram feed and I know I need to be the face of my company, but I am struggling with what profile I should focus on. Personal profile, talking about my business or business page featuring me as a brand. All right, Cliff, so I talked a little bit about this at the beginning of this live with Christine. It all depends on if you want yourself to be the umbrella brand. That's usually how most uh, personal brand people would, would address this, is you wanna be your own brand first, you have a brand, and then you do certain things. You can have multiple businesses, multiple certifications, multiple networking pieces. So if I'm my own brand, I use my personal uh, Instagram and page, Facebook page and LinkedIn to promote 
myself as a person, but then I plug in different things I do for different brands, different companies, different things. So I pepper in the family, the personal, and uh, the business so that people that are part of my network are looking at that. So I'm comfortable doing that because I don't post much of my family stuff. I mostly post what is my persona and my brand, right? So um, if you're thinking of having a social media that's uniquely personal and you wanna have a business profile, then that way you, you, you would have to do that, right? So I know my business has a profile. I have that on automated. I have some people that are posting there and doing some community stuff. But in reality, in especially Facebook and Instagram, uh, business pages are no longer easily accessible and you can't promote them as much unless you're paying to post. So it all depends on who you have in your network and where you wanna have the impact. But as most personal branding people will tell you, um, you are your brand and then your businesses, your offerings, your different things are under you. So I would do it that way. I would post on personal. But if you wanna keep it separate and distant, then post on business, which you need to pay in order to get some reach because business pages no longer have reach unless you pay for them. So I hope that helps. All right, David Monge, uh do you think 35 years old is too late to transition careers? I'm a mortgage loan or originator and due to rising rates, it's becoming difficult to close. Being that I am 35 years old, not sure if I'm late to get into a new trade. I've inquired about job openings in different trades and they're asking for a minimum a year or more of experience. I'm willing to take a pay cut and become an apprentice. Uh, David, 35 dude? <laughs> I have a business, it's all about new careers. I got, so we, we I have a business that uh, uh, helps people become coaches and business coaches. And right now we have 89 coaches certified through that program. And I have people there that are close to 70, man. So like 35 is half of that. Um, I have people that are, that have had to leave their countries, move to a different country, start a new, a new, uh, a new career. So I don't think it's ever too old to transition careers, especially if they align to what you love to do and what you like to do. Um, so 35 years, I think is perfectly fine. You're saying here you wanna take a pay cut and, and get the apprenticeship going. I'll, I'll do it, man. I I, I like the hustle. I, I, I Your question specifically is, is 35 years too old to transition careers? I've transitioned careers when I was 24, when I was 32, when I was 37, and I'm, when I'm 41. So after this is all those times in different careers, different businesses, completely different platforms and teams. So I encourage you to do it, man. Just, uh, I, I love the idea of becoming an apprentice. And if you have the mortgage thing on the side, you can, you can do this on the side, prove it, test it. And if you don't, if you don't like it, go, go a different path, man. Yeah, go and, go and do what you, what makes you happy. All right, so I think that's it. All right, hope this helped.